Uh, what I would, I would like us uh, to be very relaxed uh, during this session, not worry about time. I have a very flexible uh, ending uh, remarks that I don't even need to give. So, and if, and if uh, any, if, if the projector doesn't work or anything like that, just we're, it's like a, nothing can go wrong at a wedding. Nothing can go wrong in an event like this. Uh, it's everything that happens will make it all the more memorable. Um, I, I was, um, I'm going to start um, with a videotape uh, that I managed to find that was made of Professor Kleitman when we visited Stanford in 1981. There's just a couple of little segments uh, that I think are kind of charming. Um, and, and I'll show the first one, and then the, the second one will be preceded by a few, few slides of pictures from older times. So could we have the videotape? <laughs> Could you uh, tell us when when you actually went to the University of Chicago and, and why? And... Well, I I told you, I, I was, uh, I was an instructor of physiology at the University of Georgia, which incidentally, uh, a uh, man who hired me uh, told me uh, afterwards that when he asked somebody at the uh, Columbia University that I worked with, but uh, somebody mentioned him and I was available whether you should hire me. He says, anybody but, but him. <laughs> <laughs> no good at all. He also said that about Einstein, we had to compare myself with. <laughs> but after he hired me, he, he told me that story. And I said, well, why did you hire me? He said, I couldn't get anyone else. <laughs> and then, after I was there for a few weeks, he, he, he uh, asked me if I would stay there for another year. And foolishly, I, I agreed. And then, uh, during the summer, between the two school years, I didn't even know exactly what I, what I would like to do. And he said, why don't you go to the University of Chicago? Because they're the... the um, they have the quarter system, so in those days everything was a semester system, nothing going on in the summer except some courses with school teachers. And that's how I went to the University of Chicago during the summer of 1921. And when I was there, they asked me to stay on. But I already promised and then I would go back to to Georgia. I said, well, I'll come back in 22, but I can't I can stay on. So I came back and told them to show them how loyal I was to them. He said, a damn fool, if somebody offered me a job during the summer, I wouldn't have come back. <laughs> well, I but think that... to come to the University of Chicago, he asked the question. Yeah, well, I think in that... In those days, it was way out west, this is in the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think that you sort of gain the impression that Professor Kleitman is innately a, a modest man, and I hope there's enough... That, I have a reason to be modest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you... Now, I just would take that remark. Um, uh, I found uh, Professor Kleiman quite an amazing person, and he was in some way modest. And he, I used to ask him once, are you going to write your memoirs? And he sort of snorted at me, of course not. And, um, but, but integrity and, and honesty and all of that, I, I came to admire him uh, as much as anyone in, in my life. He, uh, I think I have these few slides. Uh, he didn't bring any slides. Uh, so uh, this, is, I, this is the one I was going to show yesterday at the end of introducing Christian Gilmano. But I thought a little bit, since we had, had a re relationship over the years, we played bridge, stuff like that, that it was kind of a strange and wonderful relationship also with Professor Kleitman, and I would say with Michel Jouvet and, and all the others. Um, so when I like to think that when Professor Kleitman started, we didn't know too much about sleep. Uh, and we thought of it as the brain turned off to some extent. Certainly the, the public did. This is just an early statement. Sleep is a short death. Here is the earliest picture of Professor Kleitman that I was able to find before my neck gave out. And I think this must be either from Russia or, or later on in uh, Turkey or Beirut. And this is a little older. And 
Here is Professor Carlson, who welcomed uh, Nathaniel Kleitman to the University of Chicago. And uh, when he asked him what he wanted to do for his thesis, he said, uh, I want to study sleep deprivation. He said, that, well, then nobody will be able to direct you. And he said, that's OK. And he was on his own for all the, the monumental work that followed. Uh, there's an, another picture with the. Now, I stopped in the Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, I don't know, it was about 15 years ago, or 20 even, and I went to the headquarters, and I said, well, you know, this thing happened here in the 30s, very famous experiment, and I wonder if you have anything in your files. It turned out they had enormous files, uh, and they let me have uh, some of the pictures, and these are just from the, the famous, very famous Mammoth Cave experiment. Here they're coming out of the cave <laughs> with the straw hats that were the fashion of the time. And another picture from that time. They had, everybody grew a beard in the cave. It was very, temperature was constant and rather cold. Exiting from the cave. This, these are the beds that they slept in in Mammoth Cave at dinner, sleeping <laughs> on the 21 hour, 21 hour day and the 28 hour day that came back recently with the Seisler experiments. Exiting the cave. And this is a, before he shaved after leaving the cave. And they actually had a banquet uh, with uh, Mrs. Kleitman and the family. This is uh, probably during around the time of World War II. Here again. And this is uh, Mrs. Kleitman. And we are actually, my wife and I were playing bridge with them. And if I have time, I have a bridge story at the end for those of you who know how to play bridge. And then uh, he was also always ready to be a subject. And mo more recently, I tried to call Don Blywise this morning to, f to get the results of the studies he'd been doing in more recent years. But you'll hear about this again a little later. That's Kate's Beware, Ernest Hartman. And this is uh, uh, Elliot Weitzman's wife and daughter, and that must have been in 1983. And th that's my mother sitting there. He, I think this was in 1985 in Seattle. Uh, so they knew one another. And then this is, uh, this is the one from the National Geographic that Professor Kleitman really didn't like too much. But it's, it's uh, the latest one that I have. And I thought I'd show a couple others. To I, I, don't, I could not find a picture of Gene Azarinsky. I'm sure that, that lack will be remedied at this meeting. And since he looks almost the way he looked in those days, <laughs> except he had more hair, uh, that'll be fine. Uh, this is 1963. And someone told me that, uh, in terms of fathers of sleep research, that Al Rechtschaffen was called the grouchy uncle. <laughs> and here's uh, Michelle Jouvet visiting Stanford some years ago. Uh, and this is, I, I want to show this because he, he gave a lecture at Cornell University in Ithaca. And he got a pretty sizable honorarium for those days. And it was in the bank there. And, and, it, and I learned it's still there. And it, the interest has been compounded for about 25 years. It's probably about half a million dollars now. Uh, <laughs> And then this is, again, the National Geographic. we got to do something dramatic, folks. Um, and that's all for the slides. I, uh, I would introduce Professor Kleitman now and just tell you he was born in Russia, at, in Kishinev, in 1995. So this is, we're here to celebrate his 100th anniversary. Um, he studied science and math as a, as a young student, and then uh, for political reasons, I, I guess, had to leave and was in Beirut, Turkey. Uh, and then uh, he came to the United States and, of course, arrived at Ellis Island. Also interesting. There other individuals that he knew who, who were on Ellis Island at the time, but he was, in a, in a sense, a war refugee. This was during World War I. He then went to the City College of New York and graduated with a master's, or bachelor's degree in 1919 and started at Columbia University as a graduate student. And he made the decision, uh, as you heard in the, in the tape, to uh, 
to come to the University of Chicago. Uh, so we can have the, the last segment of the videotape, you know, if you got it to the right place. I'm also interested in uh, your personal life as a sleep researcher. Did, did, you, did you feel, uh, how should I say, some people think it's a great burden to, to work at night. It is a great make... burden. As I told you before, I asked you if you uh, ever heard of the cascarettes. Have you anybody here heard of cascarettes? I'm sure you heard of X-Lax. <laughs> the cascarettes were the X-Lax equivalent of uh, 50 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, and they, uh, their slogan or advertising uh, slogan was, they work while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so the people who used to work in a laboratory and sleep were called cascarettes. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 You didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there's the person and family life here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I use my own children as subjects of utility, which they cooperated very well. And did you? Did, and you had a, a serene family life, even when you stayed out all night. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Uh, if you, uh, I didn't stay out every night, but uh, many nights. <laughs> uh, could you perhaps tell us a tiny bit about what it was like to be a subject yourself when you stayed awake for some of those very long periods of time? Well, I found out when I reported to others that it's much easier to stay awake during certain hours than during, during other hours, and that the, <clears throat> and that the diurnal effect was to uh, suggest that you're, you're better off after more hours of sleep than after fewer hours of sleep if your temperature was going up. We also, of course, studied at that time the uh, relation between uh, reaction time and body temperature. We found that the higher the body temperature, the shorter the reaction time. So you really are the poor, poor performer when your temperature is low. That's what it wants. You're no good. Mm. So, some of us have been interested in whether or not age affects the ability to go without sleep. Well, what, what's that concern? I can't tell, but I can tell you that much, that age definitely affects the ability to sleep through the night. Because when I was uh, younger, unless I worked during the night, I would fall asleep and then wake up next morning at either my alarm clock or by myself at the same hour. But, uh, since I've moved into the upper brackets. I can't do that. So apparently, sleep isn't as deep in the older people as it is in younger ones, and that's why so many use sleeping pills and various means of, because they feel that they should be going to sleep at 11 and get up at 7, just like they, they, they did 50 years ago, and not realizing they're already retired, they have nothing to do. They sit on a park bench to look at the trees before they know they're asleep. They watch television in the evening or go to a movie in the evening. Good example, older people fall asleep at movies. Younger people don't, don't do that, you see. So it's interesting enough to be, to be excited. So sit down in a chair, relax, and fall asleep. But if someone asks you to volunteer for a sleep deprivation study as a subject yeah. right now, yeah. would you be inclined to do it? Yeah, let's see why not. Dr. Kleiner? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I'd like to know if you would like to volunteer for study this summer. Yes, I, uh, I, I think we so. We may or may not keep you up all night, but we'd like yeah. to keep you with yeah. us for a couple of days. I told Dr. Clement I, I, I have seen no reason why I shouldn't do it. How about, got all these witnesses. <laughs> how about living in a time-free environment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it that you don't dislike the shorter sleep that seems to go more. I do dislike it. Yeah. There's nothing I, I take it good naturedly. I take it as I take your gray hair or something like that, or cataracts or that sort of thing. You die young, you avoid all these things. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't avoid this 100th anniversary. Uh, I just thought I'd point out in the audience in that videotape, of course, you heard Mary Karskadden taking a, seizing the day, as it were. Gary Richardson was there, 
that was Chuck Seisler who wanted to get him into a time-free environment. Christian Gilmano was there. John Oram, I don't know if you recognize him. Merrill Mittler, Ted Baker, Arthur Fouts, Richard Coleman, uh, and I'm pretty sure Don Blywise was there also. And then Don actually uh, did do quite extensive studies uh, longitudinally on Professor Kleitman. Well, I would say that you, Dr. Kleitman, you've been very patient, and so it, it's time now to hear from you. And I say take all the time you want. I think you have an extremely attentive audience here. But first, I'd like to introduce uh, his family and just have them stand up and, and take a bow. It's, uh, his daughters, Esther and Hortense, are here. Can we have the lights? Could the lights go up, please? <laughs> there. Uh, Esther and Hortense and, and Esther and Steve Modzkowski and William Snower. And Now I'd like to introduce. I knew this would happen. <laughs> it's a really wonderful moment, Professor Kleitman. up at the audience when I speak, but right now, the light in front of me is so blinding that I just assume that you're all there and I heard you <laughs> start, so I have no longer doubt. I'm interested in the nervous system for no reason except that I was interested in it. And I was greatly impressed by the work of Piron on the uh, physiological problem of sleep. And uh, in many places, I found the reports on sleep, but nobody seems to be bothered to explain why wakefulness operates and how it operates, assuming it is for granted. I also assume now that the people in front of me are awake rather than, uh, than asleep. But uh, the problem of sleep and explanation of sleep uh, is sort of missing in any dictionaries or any textbook of physiology or any problem of the nervous system and so forth. So I thought I would like to look into the problem of sleep and maybe inf get information there by studying wakefulness and compare the two. And my uh, original uh, start on the subject was on uh, and working in the Department of Physiology, I know Dr. Dement uh, mentioned it to you because I couldn't hear and understand what he was saying, but uh, the Department of Physiology at the University of Chicago, where I entered as a student, the head of the department, uh, A.J. Carlson, also known as Ajax, was a very bright man and greatly interested in all topics of physiology, but his own subject was physiology of the nervous, nervous stomach, hunger contraction of the stomach and things pertaining to metabolism and most of the students, if not all of them, coming in a partner of physiology to work for a master's or doctor's degree would be doing some work pertaining to his interests so as to be uh, guided and, uh, and corrected and uh, encouraged in the subject they're working on. But nobody there was working on sleep. When I mentioned Dr. Carlson about his subject, uh, he was very uh, uh, frank with me and told me he didn't know much about it, but as long as I was willing to guide myself, I'm a perfect all right to be in the department. But uh, actually, he and Dr. Lockhart, his second uh, command, were a great help to me in the process of uh, Working, I don't want to see it treated me like a like a stranger. 
And my first uh, topic also, I, I can't very well look up at the audience as I usually do when I talk because I say I can't see anything on account of the brightness of the light. So excuse me if I look down and more or less read what I have to say rather than keep my head up and uh, expect uh, attention on the part of the audience. So my first uh, work on the Department of Physiology in the way of research was to study the effect of prolonged sleeplessness, thinking that if we see what happens after prolonged sleeplessness, we find out what is what uh, wakefulness is all about and how it's carried out. And so my first paper published in 1923 dealt with prolonged sleeplessness in man. And we kept them awake for quite some time, then see how they behave and what really is missing in their uh, activities to, uh, uh, to show what wakefulness is uh, all about. And uh, so I will skip a number of things about myself since I presume Dr. Uh, uh, what introduced me was uh, <laughs> getting some information uh, on you. And uh, so I will skip what I was going to say, something about a partner physiology and how it worked, because I, I imagine Dr. Dement is taking care of the, uh, of the subject. So I also excuse me if I more or less read what I'm going to say because I'm not likely to miss anything rather than, since I cannot see anybody and looking at the audience uh, uh, all the time. So as I said my first uh, attempt was to determine what happens when you keep awake for, for a long time and how you re recover from the extreme sleepiness which you developed and can uh, hardly uh, f fight uh, against. And uh, so uh, one of the uh, things that I wanted to deal with or to look into is uh, what happens uh, when you stay awake uh, for a long time? What happens uh, after that? Uh, uh, after that time. So, my uh, first attempt was to see what happens. In, in connection with uh, people waking up or getting up in the morning and find out what happened during the night. If they dreamt, some have and some haven't, and some don't recall it, and get an idea of the characteristic of the uh, state uh, at that time. So the question was, how do we find out if a person was uh, dreaming uh, during a particular part of the sleep uh, episode. And we found uh, quite accidentally that one uh, characteristic uh, uh, during the uh, dreaming is uh, a rapid eye movement from side to side, which uh, can be fairly uh, easily observed under closed eyelids if a sufficient amount of uh, illumination around there. And also, it also disturbed the sleeper. So we arranged for uh, a system of recording the eye movements, rapid eye movements from side to side, which uh, we found uh, always accompanying dreaming and uh, determine uh, the rate of movement and the duration of movement and the incidence of movement, how long it lasts and, and uh, what part of the sleep is occupied by, uh, by that phenomenon. I also want to add that in addition to the uh, rapid eye movements which had to record by, by this method, 
on moving paper. We also studied the uh, phenomenon of the, uh, or the, uh, the character of the brain waves in the cerebral cortex, which are characteristic of wakefulness, the, 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 the size of the, of the uh, wave uh, length and the number and so forth. And also uh, during sleep and during the time when the eye move, moves, there was certain very low uh, intensity and very rapid uh, uh, continuation. So we, we are fairly certain that the, the rapid eye movements are accompanied by changes in the cerebral cortex activity and the type of activity is a characteristic of the waking state, the duration and the size of the uh, of the uh, wave, of the waves. I also uh, uh, noticed and reported by to me by students, particularly Azarinsky, who was going to talk to you later, was that uh, there is an in increase in the respiration rate and the heart rate, in addition to these uh, waves uh, characteristic of uh, Awake for us. So all these together gave us a very good indication that the individual was dreaming during that time. So during the night, we found a number of cycles, so to speak, a certain duration of sleep and a certain duration of wakefulness, and a uh, wave of the two of them, sleep and wakefulness amounted to about 90 minutes to, uh, to uh, two hours, and uh, a small fraction of it, 20 or 30 minutes, were occupied by the uh, waves characteristic of uh, dreaming. So it would give us a chance to study without waking the subject, just when it occurred, how long it occurred, and how frequently it occurred. So, and that was an unexpected way of getting at the dreaming phenomenon without uh, awaking the subject. And uh, if for no other reasons, the uh, rapid eye movements will, uh, will tell us what the brain waves are doing and what the respiration is doing and what the heart rate is doing. It's a way that I was establishing the uh, presence in duration of dreaming. We also found that when we awake the individual at the end of uh, such a 20 or 30 minute period of low wave sleeves, they were always, not always, but nearly always, reported they have been dreaming, and if you call them during the little slow waves, uh, they rarely if ever said that they were dreaming. Even those that, uh, that were dreaming didn't always record it, but most of the time they recorded. And right away, after, after you wake them up, would give you a report of what they were dreaming and uh, to make things that uh, uh, really can be reserved and studied later, we'd have it recorded on a uh, machine, which later can be played, so to speak, and, hear the stories of what happened and how it happened and so on and so forth. We also had an individual uh, report himself the next day as to what, he, if, he, if he did record dreaming, as to what he was dreaming about uh, and whatever he recorded, we compare it to what he recorded immediately on the waking up and gave us an idea of certain things which he omitted, either forgot or suppressed. Many of these things, what we would call uh, antisocial, a person uh, dreamt that he got, got mad at somebody and uh, hit him or killed him. Very, very often didn't uh, report or recall it, and of course he wouldn't do it when he was awake because he knew that he was going to pay for it, be arrested, maybe himself executed and in punishment. So it gave us an idea of the 
sort of uh, poor characteristic in knowing and remembering what you're dreaming if there's any antisocial elements uh, in it. So that was an unexpected way of finding out if and when and how and what was in the contents of the, uh, of the dreams. Now, in addition to that, it gave us an idea of uh, what a characteristic of the uh, acti activity, the so-called rest activity cycle of the, uh, of the uh, brain wave, the number of waves, duration of waves, half a dozen waves in the dimension duration, 20 or 30 minutes, and uh, uh, what was uh, what was in them. The other feature, which is uh, really uh, of importance here, is that certain phenomena or activities accompanying the rapid eye movements were hunger contractions of an empty stomach, uh, and also, in addition, uh, sexual excitation like erection of the penis. So indicating that uh, during that period, the individual was dealing with uh, feeding, which of course involves self-preservation, and also uh, adding more materials happens during a growing period before a person has reached the age of 20 or so. And the uh, sexual excitation, of course, would come into the picture after uh, puberty. <coughs> so there was a picture we could learn a good deal by recording without uh, actually disturbing the individual uh, during sleep. Now, when it uh, comes to uh, the uh, explanation of what we learn about wakefulness by studying first sleep and and the, the number of different waves in there is that what we really are, uh, are dealing with activity is something that can be carried out during sleep. You can have, you can eat your meal and you can have a sexual intercourse while you're asleep. So these features presumably would be something that should occur in various active uh, period, phases of sleep during uh, wakefulness. So we would develop what we call a basic rest activity cycle pertaining to the basic phenomena of self-preservation and preservation of the species. And we'll learn a good deal about the activity of the uh, individual during wakefulness by studying the various characteristics and finding what's what's lapping and, and missing there, and what uh, comes back uh, by this special looking into it. And also we found that uh, certain individuals from their behavior uh, be betrayed the uh, rapid phase of the uh, cycle. There's a person sitting in a, in a chair reading, uh, reading a book or a paper, Every once in a while, we'll uh, light a cigarette or, uh, or take a drink. Uh, and uh, he's always coincided with the, with the active phase of the basic rectitivity uh, cycle. That is a confirm the idea that we're, with, uh, we're dealing with. So by studying sleep, we learn a good deal about wakefulness and also the characteristic wave, which is very often <coughs> suppressed or disregarded. A person works eight hours a day and he's doing the work, he, he can't very well uh, uh, deal with uh, creative activity, which might be in, in, uh, helped by the uh, active phase of the basic activity cycle. So by studying sleep, we learn a great deal about wakefulness and also about a characteristic uh, wave of uh, greater or lesser uh, analytical activity, so to speak, 
which we couldn't uh, know about or guess about uh, individually, I mean, uh, before that, and uh, also about the characteristic of a sleep basic factor every cycle, which also brings about wakefulness, and also by the various methods, by the composition of a sleep uh, episode, and also what, what it shows about the individual or his past uh, experience. That's essentially what uh, we accomplished by studying sleep, learning we a lot about sleep, but also about wakefulness and its characteristics. Thank you. Talks, wouldn't you rather sit down? Well, you wouldn't be without Wait, Do whatever you want. Do you want to stay here? Yeah, I'll stay here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How about that for stamina? Um, I, as uh, Professor Kleinman was talking, I was kind of trying to wonder why I, I didn't actually have more uh, material uh, related to Gene Azarinsky, and, and I, I actually remembered that when we actually got one quarter to do research at the University of Chicago Medical School. It was in the freshman year, and I didn't know what to do because uh, I, I was interested in some clinical things, and so I didn't take advantage of that. And then when I, uh, there was the, finally the course in neurophysiology, and uh, Professor Kleitman can't believe this, but it was his lecture that sort of turned me on finally as, as a, as a, an investigator, as someone deeply curious about sleep, et cetera. And of course, when I approached him then, I was a full-time medical student. And, and I kind of think that, that I would stay up all night helping uh, Gene Azarinsky, and then of course I'd be in a, kind of a fog in the day. I didn't know there was such a thing as a sleep debt, so that I almost got tossed out of school a couple of times for snoring in the face of a, of a professor, but it, <laughs> So now, maybe I'm, my memory was a little affected. I don't know. But at any rate, um, that was kind of heroic, I always thought. To, uh, but that's stupid now, of course. Uh, I'd like to, the next speaker, and I'm really, and I think uh, we'll, we'll have um, Dr. Azarinsky speak, and that's sort of the discovery of rapid eye movements. And then if there might be a few questions, if we have time, and then, uh, Michelle Juve will go on and bring us to the duality of sleep, and, I, and if that may be, uh, take care of things. Uh, anyway, I was, Dr. Azarinsky was born uh, uh, on May 16th, so we're close to his birthday, in 1921, and you'll be, you'll be amazed to see his vigor in New York City. And I'd like to bring him to the podium now, uh, Gene. Thank you. You've already met uh, Professor Kleitman and also his family, including uh, Esther, who was one of my subjects. And indeed, uh, Professor Kleitman was one of my subjects, too, as he's volunteered uh, so many times for other people, he also volunteered to be my subject many times. And indeed, he was a subject exactly three times in those experiments that had been reported upon in my thesis and in the three subsequent papers. There is 
uh, one other person here in this auditorium that's of interest to us, and uh, sh she also was a subject of mine. She also is a daughter of mine. Jill, <coughs> Jill Asher, would you please stand up? It's hard to believe it, but Jill wasn't a baby uh, at the time. Maybe not so hard to believe. She was a very, actually, she was a very young baby at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I examined her eyes very carefully right after she was born for the next few months to ascertain whether or not she had rapid eye movements because on the original study in infants, I hadn't even thought of rapid eye movements, and so I didn't pay that much attention. But now that I knew there were eye movements, rapid eye movements, I paid very close attention, looked at Jill's eyes, and um, I didn't see any rapid eye movements. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Bill DeMent has given me some leeway here to talk very slowly, and, um, and he's also indicated that I'm so terribly young. Uh, I don't wanna, <clears throat> I'm not Dorian Gray, and I'm much older on the inside. <laughs> and when I th throw out statistics at you, I don't want you to think that I'm an idiot uh, uh, who is able to recall uh, events uh, completely. That's not true. Knowing that I was going to be here, I managed to look at some of the protocols that I have that actually are from way back in the early 50s, and I reviewed them, and therefore um, it won't be so miraculous that I can remember that well. I should point out very quickly that I had something like uh, 10 years of uh, college before I went to the University of Chicago, and uh, I didn't have a bachelor's degree, and I didn't have a master's degree. In fact, I had no degree because I had jumped from being a social science major to a Spanish major, went to pharmacy school, went to dental school, and uh, <clears throat> was a social worker, was in the Department of Employment Security as a supervisor looking for jobs for people, and had even served overseas uh, in the capacity of a machine gunner for the OSS. And so at that juncture, I decided that perhaps I ought to go back to academia and obtain a degree. Went to the University of Chicago with the idea of becoming a histologist, but it so happened that with all the courses that I had, I was lacking some prerequisite. And so I decided, well, physiology is close enough. So I became, I entered the, the physiology department. Interested in heart science, uh, I was also interested in organ physiology, but at the time that I was there, the University of Chicago was uh, quite progressive, and the emphasis had already become on cellular physiology, and there were not many uh, mammalian physiologists in the department. There were a few, and having learned of the reputation of uh, Professor Kleitman, that he was extremely rigorous in, the, in his procedures, and he had a tremendous reputation for reliability, I thought that indeed he would be an appropriate sponsor, and I approached Dr. Kleitman, and it was ad advantageous for me that he accepted me as a student. And he proposed a project for me. He wanted me to find out whether the blinking rate would cease abruptly upon falling asleep, or as were as more, more likely, the blinking rate would decrease gradually as one fell asleep. And so I embarked on that project with uh, initial uh, anxiety, but hope that I would, have, I would finally conclude that successfully. But after a few months of working with that, I realized that it was an impossible project because I was examining infants, young infants, in their mother's homes and uh, without any intrusive devices, purely by visual observation, I would have to determine uh, 
uh, whether the infant was blinking or not blinking, and it was simply impossible for me to ascertain uh, what, what blinking was. There was no operational definition that I could apply that was worthwhile. So to salvage that project, I decided that never mind blinking, I will simply look at lid movements, whether they were caused by the uh, contraction of the apicularis oculi, or whether they were passive movements caused by the movement of the eye globe. Never mind. Simply look at the quantification of lid movements. And I did that. The end result was that the lid movements started off rather strongly as the infant was going to sleep, and they gradually decreased until ultimately there were no eye movements whatsoever, no lid movements whatsoever. And this situation recurred again and again in that infant so that this period of ocular quiescence was recurrent. And because it was re recurrent, I termed that period of ocular quiescence a no eye movement period or a NEM. Of course, you never heard of a NEM. But it was a no eye movement period. <clears throat> and it was a period because it recurred, basically in an hourly session. What was most remarkable to me at that time was the constancy of the duration of this period of ocular quiescence when there were no lived movements whatsoever. And that was in the order of 20 minutes. I didn't think too much of it, except the mothers did. The mothers were anxious to get me out of the house. And they would ask me frequently, well, when is this baby going to wake up? Or when are you going to leave? <laughs> and uh, I would look at my protocols, look at the period of ocular quiescence that I already had, and I would say, oh, in about uh, 12 minutes. And invariably, give or take a couple of minutes, the baby would wake up, or at least squirm. And the mother was just... Uh, to totally bemused by what had happened. And so was I. I couldn't understand why, what was this 20, what was this NEM period about? But nevertheless, it, it existed. And once that study uh, concluded, the next step, of course, was to examine adults. And I thought, well, this will be interesting because what kind of NEM period will I find in an adult? So the NEM period was very helpful in a way. But, and very confusing, and led to a lot of confusion too. But in a way, it, it, it's, it led to the, to the uh, recognition of rapid eye movements later on. Now this, um, I think my assignment today is to indicate to you how rapid eye movements were discovered. So I'm going to have to throw a little bit of numbers at you so you can understand what's happening. The, 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 uh, the first reports on rapid eye movement sleep were uh, presented in 1953. I presented an abstract in 1953 in Chicago. And since then, there have been two additional reports, one published in Science and one published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. <clears throat> Those three reports also the thesis, were predicated on 52 sleep sessions. Those 52 sleep sessions, therefore, did not indicate how the discovery was made, what transpired before the discovery was made. Rather, those 52 sessions were a matter, were a matter of amassing data, which would then be analyzed for various reasons. So in essence, what I have to talk about is not those 52 sessions, but what transpired before those 52 sessions. Because when those 52 sessions were undertaken, the discovery of rapid arguments had already been made. Uh, during, this, during the 52 sessions, I must say, because Bill DeMent has given me permission to tell anecdotes, I must say that I was in a rush, really, to obtained my degree. And those 52 sessions were performed in something like six and a half months. So I was working 
uh, with full sleep sessions by myself twice a week. I was a head of the physiology laboratory at the medical school. I was teaching a neuroanatomy course, taking a couple of courses myself, and in a dead rush to get to complete all of this work. So the work for the 52 sessions was actually repetitive. And at that time, I was fortunate in obtaining some assistance because Professor Kleitman had introduced uh, me to uh, Bill DeMent and told me that Bill DeMent would work <clears throat> under my aegis and I would essentially indicate to Bill DeMent what the procedures were with the understanding that after I would leave, Bill DeMent would follow through. And Bill DeMent uh, helped me in about five of those uh, sessions and I was, very, I was very worried because I was, I was afraid of having any kind of mistake. And so I remember one time that uh, Bill <laughs> <laughs> after a few, a, a few sessions with me, I decided, well, I'll let Bill handle this by himself. And I went home to get a night's sleep. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. I thought, I better go back to the laboratory and see what's happening. <laughs> <clears throat> so I went back to the lab. The lab is dark. I opened up the door. I can see the polygraph pens moving wildly, paper piling up on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill DeMent <clears throat> was, had his head on the, on the polygraph and he was asleep. <laughs> well, I thought to myself, well, this is to be expected. What can you expect of a, of a medical student who is interested in psychiatry, of all things? <laughs> so, <clears throat> but still, he was better than the, uh, than the previous uh, assistant I had who was interested in studying snoring. <laughs> so we now go back to the uh, experiments and the sleep sessions that occurred before these 52, because these 52 are just repetitions. What happened before 52 was that after I, f I found this NEM period, no eye movement period, I was going to apply the same procedure to adults, but you try to watch an adult sleep for all night just with your head six inches away from the person's eye, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And, and quantification is not that easy, so obviously I had to turn to some more complex method. And that was a polygraph, to use a, a polygraph, and to use something like electrooculography. This, the, if the work on the infants was concluded around 1950. The eye movements, rapid eye movements were not discovered until 1952, the early part of 1952. So what happened between 1950 and 1952? I was uh, struggling and, and trying to find out what kind of a method to use for recording. The EOG was uh, in, indeed an obvious choice because one can study eye movements while the lids are closed, but nobody had done it during sleep, and all, the, and all of you know what problems there are with a person sleeping, pulling wires, and so forth. And even so, the corneal rectal potential would change during time. There's dark adaptation, this, that, and the other thing. All sorts of problems would have to be uh, worked out. Suffice to say, uh, a lot of time was spent doing that. But the biggest problem is I had no polygraph. So I had dug out of the bottom, of the, somewhere in the basement of Abbott Hall in Chicago. I found a um, polygraph. It was an Offner polygraph, supposedly one of the best polygraphs at that time. There was only one trouble with the polygraph. It didn't work. <laughs> and when I turned it on, the calibration signal was waving up and down at the lost cause. And uh, I knew a little bit of electronics, but it was beyond me. And so I called in the, uh, a real hot shot in the department, a whiz in electronics, a fellow by the name of Shirley Bryant, who was a graduate student then and who is currently a professor of pharmacology at the University of Cincinnati Medical School. 
And I begged Shirley, I said, Shirley, help me fix this machine. Well, he uh, looked at the machine. He said, well, I can't help you unless you get a schematic. And so fortunately, Frank Offner, who was the manufacturer of the Offner polygraph, was in Chicago. I called him up. Offner had no idea what I was talking about. And finally, he recalled, oh, yes, he said, that instrument was an instrument that I jerry uh, built myself. That was a prototype for the machine that was going to be in production. He said, There's no, there is no schematic available for this. <clears throat> well, then again, I went back to, to uh, Bryant and I said, you, you have to do something. So together, we played with that machine for a long time, and it was just horrendous. And finally, we got to the point where the calibration signal was at least reasonably stable. So I now needed a subject to try this. And of course, in the true Kleitman tradition, I uh, used my family. Uh, <laughs> That was not my daughter, Jill, because uh, she wasn't even born at that time. So <clears throat> I used my son, who was about eight years old, and tied him up to the machinery. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had to do. He, he was smaller than I was, believe me. <clears throat> and what I found was that there was an electronic noise that lasted in the order of 20 minutes. And uh, that was very confusing to me because I was looking for NEM, for no eye movements, and here I'm getting this electronic noise. And I recall uh, speaking to Professor Kleitman, and he looked at this record and said, well, you'll have to do this again. And of course, I did it again, and I did it again, and every time I did it, I would still get this electronic noise. I called in a couple of other subjects, got this electronic noise again, and I was recording electro elect the electrooculograms and, uh, and other parameters then, but I was fairly convinced that I was getting some sort of a biological response, that this was not truly uh, some electronic interference. So, but I knew one thing, that whether, th whether there were eye movements there or not, that yeah. there was some sort of a 20 minute period analogous to the NEM period that was occurring, and it seemed to be real. But what, what, what was this electronic noise? I was out to record eye movements, but there was no way I could tell that I had eye movements or some other waveform, which could have been anything, skin potentials, EK, uh, EEGs, so forth, a whole, a whole variety. And I would say this was probably the most crucial time in the entire period that I spent in looking at eye movements. Uh, I was at a total loss. This went on for weeks. I called up uh, Gibbs, who was one of the foremost electroencephalographers in the world. I posed the problem to him, and he listened to it, and he said, well, the problem of the signal-to-noise ratio, the problem of noise in electroencephalography is inherent in that. He said, there is, that's a problem that we all face, and my best suggestion to you is abandon the EOG and go to a mechanical method. <clears throat> well, as they say, uh, this was an absolute impossibility for me because to think in terms of strain gauges and to go into a whole new methodology meant probably a, another year of study. And here I had invested all this time on the electrooculography. This uh, puzzlement persisted for not weeks, but I think for months, as I recall. And, um, and suddenly I had an inspiration. I thought, well, perhaps if I use two pairs of, of electrodes to record eye movements, I could uh, examine the, uh, the amplitude and the phase relationships that I picked up. And that would uh, reduce the, the, uh, the probability that this was simply uh, noise. I would really be able to detect eye movements. So I dashed over to Shirley Bryant, my, my, uh, this, my helper there, and uh, explained what I was going to do. And he looked at that. He said, you have discovered, no, not discovered, rediscovered a principle that's well known in engineering. And he gave it some sort of name that I can't remember. 
and which I thought, well, maybe I, I should remember it now as I, uh, I'm going to talk to you today. And so about three, four days ago, I called up Shirley Bryant and I asked him, I said, do you remember that name that you gave to it? He said, no, I don't remember. So I felt a lot better. He didn't remember the name either. <laughs> And very shortly afterwards, I used that method on my son, and uh, lo and behold, after running the paper through at 50 millimeters per second, and, or faster, I don't remember, I had 100, I used, sped it through, there was no question I could identify fast eye movements. There was no doubt about it in my, in my mind at all. And so you could say that the first recognition of REM took place at that time, which was in April of 1952. And that preceded those runs, those mechanical runs, that started in October of 1952. <clears throat> Just at that time, I thought to myself, well, wait a second, I see these fast eye movement periods here. Why didn't I see them in those infants before? And this is where my daughter Jill came in. She, she, she was born just at the right time. I, 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 it wasn't planned. At any rate, I, 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 I very carefully examined her, her uh, eye movements and uh, the pattern she had fit in exactly with all the other infants. There was no rem. Well now this, um, this 20 minute NEM period and the 20 minute REM period was totally confusing to me and was confusing later on, even to this day, confusing. Later on, this is not at the time of the, of the study, but years later, I examined the uh, REM periods of adults and um, in terms of their density, how many eye movements there were per unit of time in a REM period. And lo and behold, I found that a REM period was basically 20 minutes long, 40 minutes long, or 60 minutes long, more or less. We're dealing now with an average figure. So that there was something peculiar about this 20 minute cycle. When it was first published, incidentally, naturally people rejected it. But then, and then others, uh, did work with much more uh, sophisticated equipment, and it has turned out that there is this strange cyclicity of 20, 18 minutes, 20 minutes, one can argue, but within the REM period. <clears throat> now, there's another aspect to this that's kind of interesting. Why did, it, why, why did I term it REM period? Well, period, obviously, because it was repetitive. That is, there were a number of such periods, so, and that's a period because it could have been an epic, it could have been an episode, it could have been a number of other things that it would call. Why rapid? And that's been one of the mistakes I made that I recognized in that study. It, I should not have termed it rapid. I should have termed it a jerky eye movement. <laughs> <clears throat> and I knew it at the time. I knew that, that they were jerky because that's what they seemed like to me. They looked jerky. But I didn't want to use the term jerky for obvious reasons. <laughs> well, some, um, some years elapsed, incidentally, so now I have to skip more to the future. And um, I decided to use the third derivative of motion to study eye movements. This third derivative of motion is used by practically nobody. In fact, engineering textbooks say it's, it's not used for anything, really. But I try to use the, uh, the third derivative of motion because that is the engineering definition of jerk. <laughs> <clears throat> and to refresh your memory, this is the, uh, the uh, has to do with the change in the rate of acceleration. But there was a problem with measuring jerkiness using the third derivative, and that is that the third derivative, this measure of, of, uh, of, of smoothness of movement, is dependent on velocity. 
And so I reformulated the third derivative and called it a proportional jerk, and this has been published. And um, to re-examine eye movements again with this particular measure. And what was found and what has been published is that if you study the eye movements of an adult, for example, um, one finds that there is a highly significant difference in the jerkiness of the movements of the eyes during RAM as compared to the saccadic movements of the eyes when the lids are closed. And this is highly significant. So what? Not much, except that when Dr. Joan Lynch and I used the same measure of, of jerkiness on infants, lo and behold, we found that there was no significant difference whatsoever in the jerkiness between the uh, so-called REM in the, or in the active state of infants, the very young infants, and the saccadic type of eye movement seen when the infants were awake. So we've got an entirely different picture now, and it put into question whether or not infants indeed have REM, and I don't believe they do, at least uh, I'm not inclined to think they do, based on our work with this measure of jerkiness. <clears throat> Which goes back again to the initial confusion of uh, the infants not having REM, and I reported them in my thesis and elsewhere that I didn't see REM then, and I think I may have been right in not seeing them. Now, with, with respect to, uh, to recognizing uh, the relationship of, of uh, REM, or GEM, I'd like to say, because I, incidentally, was, if it were termed GEM, we would have uh, GEM sessions instead of sleep sessions. But. <laughs> but with respect to the relationship of these eye movements to dreaming, um, suffice it to say that I didn't have to go far to determine that there might be a relationship because right in the same building uh, was a extremely well-known physiologist by the name of Luckhart, Arno Luckhart. And in 1916, he um, wrote a paper relating uh, the muscular activity of dogs uh, to dreaming. He was studying hunger contractions, so, and he concluded that there was definite relationship between muscular activity and dreaming in, in, in dogs. And of course, prior to that, some 2,000 years before that, uh, someone else had made the same speculation, but I didn't know about that. But I did know about Arlo Luckhart. And uh, <clears throat> so there are many uh, discussions uh, that uh, Professor Kleifman and I had of what these eye movements might mean, what they might not mean. Uh, one idea that, uh, that I had was that perhaps these eye movements were some sort of a physiological seizure, a physiological uh, output from the cortex uh, that might have nothing whatsoever to do with dreaming. As a matter of fact, uh, I still think that that may, may be the case. But what really convinced me that there was some sort of relationship between the REM and at least the recall of dreaming was one event, and that was a medical student whom I had as a subject uh, who exhibited tremendous eye movements, uh, rapid eye movements, to such an extent that as I was sitting at the polygraph, I thought, well, by golly, what's going on in that room? Because the the subject was in another room. I dashed into the room, looked at the, su at the subject, and there I could see very easily these violent, jerky eye movements under the lids, and he was muttering, and I could make out from the muttering that he wanted to be released from the situation and so forth. And so I attempted to awaken him by calling out to him. He wasn't responding, so I knew he was asleep. But finally, with a loud voice, I woke him up, and he woke up, seemed to be quite calm. I said, well, what happened? He said, oh, this is nothing. He said, this is a nightmare that I have. It's a recurrent nightmare, and in which I feel like I'm trapped, and I get out, and so forth. And that really convinced me that, indeed, there's some sort of relationship between the dreaming and, the, and uh, these rapid eye movements. <clears throat> I have just one 
brief anecdote to relate that I think is sort of humorous. <clears throat> Before the, the presentation uh, in 1953, the first abstract on REM, um, I had uh, uh, Professor Kleitman as a subject. In fact, I had him as a subject for three nights. And on the first night, he had three REM periods. After awakening him, awakening him uh, uh, I, after each REM period, I asked him, um, were you dreaming? That was my standard question. The answer was no to one of the REM periods. The answer to a second REM period was maybe, but I don't recall anything. And the third REM period was Yes, I, uh, I did remember this, and, and some sort of description was given. A couple of days later, <clears throat> I ran Professor Clayton again, and I have to look at my timeline. This time, he had two REM periods. And after awakening him from each one, I asked, did you have any r dreams or what? And the answer was no, on both occasions. And then I had him the third time, which is now in January 53. And this time, there were no REM periods. <clears throat> so it would seem that uh, from, as I would see it, uh, Professor Kleitman uh, was not thoroughly convinced as to what was transpiring up to that point. I'm talking about REM periods. I can show him the REM periods, but the connection with, with, uh, with dreaming was kind of weak, you would, you would think, with these three. So before the presentation in Chicago, uh, Professor Kleitman approached me and asked me to run one experiment on someone else so he could observe what I had been doing and uh, he would be able to explain to people in the audience who might question him what's going on with this, with this uh, sleep uh, business. And he would see the exact procedure, and that seemed reasonable. And I told him that I would uh, bring in one of my subjects whom I, uh, whom I had readily available. No, he said, no, no, no. He'll, he'll um, use his own subject, and that was um, his daughter, Esther. So I said, well, of course, <clears throat> it's fine with me. It'll save me some work. But I was wondering why would anyone subject himself or herself to, uh, to a sleep session? It's not the most pleasant thing in the world. Nevertheless, um, she slept, she had REM, she recorded, she reported the dreaming, and now uh, was fine. The scene shifts. 11, 11 years later, I believe it was 1964, <clears throat> I was doing some research at the Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute in Philadelphia when I was approached by one of the large uh, networks <clears throat> to do a, um, a sleep study on television so that people could see where the, uh, <clears throat> what the scientists were doing in Philadelphia. And as luck would have it, my son, the one who participated in, in all of these uh, early experiments, was there in Philadelphia. I said, oh, that's fine. <clears throat> <clears throat> and my son, who was much older by this time, didn't have to acquiesce, but he did. And <clears throat> I knew this would be a, a good situation for me because there would be a lot of noise with the television crew there and lots of light and confusion, but my son Armand would, he'd sleep through this. I had him hooked up in a chamber that was in the psychiatric institute overlooking the operating room. He was in the observation chamber, and all the equipment was down in the, in the operating room. And there was a crew, a tremendous crew from the television studio, and all the nurses and all the physicians and everybody was there, it was a tremendous crowd and everything was all set, the cameras were going and so forth. And we started this about, i say about 11 o'clock at night. And 12 o'clock passed, no, no REM. One o'clock, no REM. Two o'clock, no REM. Three o'clock, no REM. 
<clears throat> with this, I began to get very worried because uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars were spent on this by the studio. And I was standing in the hallway with um, a cameraman and the uh, producer whose name was Marsha Rose. The program was called Concept. And the cameraman said, you know, he said, how do we know that that fellow up there in the chamber doesn't move his eyes voluntarily? How do we know it's REM? And Marsha Rose looked at him and said, Mac, that's not possible. You can't move your eyes when your lids are closed. When you're awake, you can't do that. And through the power of suggestion, he, he, he tried it. He closed his eyes, he tried to move them, and he couldn't do it. Uh, there was only one problem. I knew that you could do it. <laughs> and then uh, there was a flash of illumination. And I thought to myself, well, by golly, uh, that could possibly account for why uh, somebody was brought in whom you could thoroughly trust. After all, it was, it was indeed possible for someone as desperate as I to obtain a degree to have some sort of collusion with a medical student who could move his eyes on command. And I thought, whether this is true or not is immaterial. It probably was not true. But just as Dr. Kleitman had selected me as a, or accepted me as a graduate student, I too had chosen him because I knew that he was recognized in the university as one of the most careful scientists that there was, certainly in the university. And there were some wonderful people there. And so I was... Uh, I was really pleased at the time that, that there would be no stone unturned. There was no way that Professor Kleitman would allow his name to be on a paper that wasn't absolutely as sure as could be, and, and, and it was. So again, I made a good choice. I hope that he thinks he made a good choice too. Thank you. That was perfect. Perfect. Yes, no, no, I think you wanted to stand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have a seat. Well, um, I must say that stirred a few memories. Uh, <laughs> Shirley Bryant. Wow. Shirley was, he used to come up and he'd, uh, when he was talking to you, he'd take a hold of your clothing so you couldn't move away. <laughs> He's still alive. I had to get his phone number and, and say hello because he and I had a lot to do with each other after. <laughs> anyway, one memory, I know why Professor Kleitman chose his daughter because, you know, to actually bring women into the sleep lab in those days was nada. And of course, it was a family member that was okay. And, then, and as a matter of fact, that was one of the reasons I got married. Uh, <laughs> It's sort of true. Um, but I think it was in 1954, I had a, um, a girlfriend, and I was saying, well, you know, the, we're not really sure that everyone has these eye moods. We're not really sure that women have them in general, and we really need to, to observe at least one or two women. And there were long discussions about whether this was proper or not. And finally, uh, Professor Kleitman consented to allow me to study my girlfriend as long as there was a chaperone. <laughs> And the, the chaperone was Jean Azarinsky. I don't know if he remembers it. And um, there were two rooms, and there was a bed in both, both rooms. So Jean came in and promptly just went to bed and uh, did a good job of chaperoning. And <laughs> so at least the two women had rapid eye movements we knew at the time. Um, the, um, when Jean Azarinsky left the University of Chicago, uh, and then in the days after, I'm just going to go over that very, very briefly so we can move on. Uh, then I, too, uh, actually did, I think, 20, maybe 50 nights on my wife, then my wife. And uh, as, if I recall, over 100 more nights. So we're really pretty sure this was a, 
a generalized phenomenon. There was a, the non-rim, rim cycle, etc. all the stuff you all know so very well. But we did not know that there were two kinds of sleep, and that, that needs to be very clear, except that somehow the EEG patterns in the state during periods of rapid alignment was clearly, though we called it stage one, Professor Klein and I was not the same in some ways as stage one at the onset of sleep, though we did, thought they, they were the same EEG level. And Professor Kleitman coined the term emergent stage one, and then at the onset of sleep was descending stage one. And the only thing I did was a arousal threshold, which was incredibly different from stage one at the onset of sleep, where it's almost at the waking level. And then in, in a REM period, it was uh, highly significantly different. Uh, nonetheless, there was a feeling that sleep lightened periodically, uh, and that there was this single continuum, and that that lightening uh, in the sort of between waking consciousness and, and the lack of consciousness during sleep was when rapid eye movements occurred. And I think it was not until the work of Jouvet uh, in the later 50s with, with the uh, various animal preparations that he used in a, in a, in a sort of recognition uh, of the significance of the electromyogram that, that, that this concept of the duality of sleep really really emerged, and it, it took some time, and it was difficult to accept. I would only say one last thing for myself is that we then did want to observe, uh, I actually went into the newborn nursery also, and uh, I did see rapid eye movements. I had, by that time had enormous experience because we took movies. Cl Professor Clayton insisted on taking movies of these rapid eye movements. And it's, it's kind of amazing because of this, the statement that Al Rechaffen made, you know, they just, and now it's just amazing that they, they weren't seen until uh, Gene's uh, observation. But anyway, we took movies. I did go into newborn nursery and could see rapid eye movements in newborn infants at the time, but no one believed it. Absolutely no one would believe it, so I just gave it up. But I decided to observe cats because uh, a professor, Kao Liang, Cho had arrived in the department from Florida where he worked with Carl Lashley. And he was doing conditioning work in cats. And we were trying to develop this new technique of implanting electrodes. And it was just like, a, we, we couldn't make it work. And finally, uh, I studied sleep in cats with, with little needles in their scalp. And it was only certain cats would uh, allow that to be done, would actually go to sleep. Uh, so that probably getting cats to sleep under those circumstances was as difficult as trying to make that oftener work. Um, but finally, we did have some sleep episodes. It was reported later in the paper. Called, but the EEG during the periods of jerky eye movements, and there really were jerky in the cats, and the twitches and so on, was exactly remembered the active, resembled the activated EEG that you obtained at Magoon, uh, Maruzzi, and all those people that obtained in, in the uh, story of the ascending reticular activating system uh, in a fully awake animal. And that was EEG that was the sign of wakefulness and consciousness. So to see it in sleep, nobody believed it. And, and I, uh, I actually submitted a paper nine times before it was accepted. And the fact that I was a medical student, I'm sure, didn't help. Uh, going against the, the, the grain at that time. Um, at any rate, what was amazing was that you couldn't see anything in the waking state because the temporal muscles totally, obs the muscle activity totally obscured the electroencephalogram. Then when the cat went into slow wave sleep, you could sort of see the undulations. And then when the cat went into REM sleep, you could see the EG perfectly because there was no muscle potential. And, and that's one of my biggest failures. I just didn't appreciate the significance of that. And Professor Cho came out once, the cat was lying on a table twitching and this activated EEG and he just couldn't believe it and he, he didn't want to have his name on the paper. Uh, <laughs> so he thought probably Magoon would come after him. Um, the only final thing I wanted to mention was that what I do remember vividly with working with Gene Azarinsky was was vacuum tubes, and uh, th that was a, certainly a different era for those of you who were young. Working with, with an amplifier with vacuum tubes was 
was really tough. Um, so I think at this, at this point, um, and we're, we're going to ignore the clock. We're not going to get tense or any, anything like that because of the clock. So we'll, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Michelle Jouvet, who is a giant of sleep research. Uh, he was born on the 16th of November in 1925 in Lons-le-Saunier, but it's very important to say that's in Jura. And he was one of the early members of the Jura Liberation Front. Uh, you apparently don't appreciate the significance of that. And he was also in the resistance in World War II. So Michelle, wherever you are. Blackman, Professor Aserensky, dear Bill, it's very difficult to discover the root of a discovery. There are many causes, and usually there is also chance. But if I look back to the past, I would found three main factors. The first one is ideologic, uh, due to my stay in the Maki, I was mainly with people from the left, and mainly people who were from the communist. And uh, when I went back in the civilian life, I tried to decide. I was interested in Pavlov, of course, because uh, Pavlov was important. And when came uh, Maruzzi and Magun paper, I had to decide who was right the East with Pavlov, and the West with uh, Maurizio and Magun. So I decided to do some experiment in order to, to found the truth, which of course is totally stupid. The second, <laughs> the second uh, main problem is that I had the opportunity to learn basic neurophysiology in the USA and in one of the best laboratories at this time, in 1954, in the VA Long Beach Hospital, uh, where Magun was working. And the third uh, cause is a, a tremendous luck when one day I put just by chance one electrode in the right place in the brainstem. So let me now review very quickly those period of uh, First, the, the start, starting of, uh, okay, one should be, let's see, okay, this one, this is, no, oh, why is it? everything will go as everywhere, and this is, okay, so this is the first period, as you can see, I was in the Alpine troops with the, <laughs> The stupid uniform, very dark. <laughs> when, when you have to fight in the in the snow, you are just being <laughs> stupid. And uh, oh, everything really goes. How's it going? But uh, okay, so I choose to. to to use those two things. Okay, so when I went, uh, went into medical school, okay, this was a per how I look Europe at this time, you know, the red part, uh, there was the Soviet were really near, and at this time I was a, a resident in neurosurgery, and I was quite interested to read Pavlov, and you can see this was edition from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. I was so much interested in Pavlov that uh, I went to the workers and the nurses, everything, try to convince them that uh, Pavlov was right and that uh, 
this kind of a, because the communist used Pavlov as a, as a great teacher that Marxism was probably very good. Then one day, somebody came to me, a good friend, and he, tell me, he told me, oh my God, I cannot, that stupid thing that you use most. <laughs> And he told me, just look. No, wait, no, I think I can learn. <laughs> I and mean, he just told me, you say that the cortex is very important for waking, for sleep, for everything, but look, there is a paper in the Easy Journal. This was a seminal paper by Morozi and Magoon. Uh, 1949, 1950, the discovery of the mesencephalic ascending reticular formation and the starting of a thing that in the brainstem, there would be something very important. So immediately, I say, okay, well, if I could go to, to work in Magoon's laboratory, and at this time, since I was a veteran, it was easy to get a Fulbright Fellowship. So I got this uh, Fulbright Fellowship. But before going to the state, I tried at least to do some experiment. And uh, at this time, uh, my good friend Paul Dell uh, explained me how to do servo isolate Now, if I push them at the same time, they should go. <laughs> One is going, the other should go. No, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know, still. <laughs> to, to, to answer. And this was my first paper I did. Uh, before going in Magoon's lab, it was published when just I came back. Uh, this was a paper showing that uh, this encephal is only preparation. Of course, you have a lot of slow wave activity in the cortex. This I give. Uh, enormous dose of amphetamine, and I did not get any activation. And by chance, I injected caffeine, and to my great surprise, I got uh, activation of the cortex. Uh, when I came in Magus lab, I showed this to him. He said, this is extraordinary interesting, but I happened to, he, he was saying this to everybody. But uh, this is my first work, and it's very strange that, uh, in fact, uh, it seems to be, I was interested in waking at this time, and I don't know if there is any uh, explanation for that uh, caffeine may activate the cerebral preparation, should act on those uh, new waking system. Then, uh, then, this is Lyon in, in, in uh, just before I left the uh, railroad city. Then, okay, I arrived, it works. <laughs> in Long Beach, that's at Long Beach Harbor, and I started to work in, uh, in, in this place, which was an extraordinary place. At this time, there were plenty of uh, pe very gifted people, uh, Robert Livingston, Charles Sawyer, French, Mr. French, uh, Segundo, uh, Terzolo, Tokizani, and if you can see it, and I met Raul Hernandez Peon. This is a picture taken when we were at the Grand Canyon. And Raul Hernandez Peon from, was from Mexico, he was from uh, the Yucatan, and he was also, he had, he had read about Pavlov. And he was also interested to do mostly chronic experiments, because there was mostly acute experiment in Magnus lab. So we both started to work together, and we worked on habituation. This is our click, evoke potential in the cochlear nucleus. So we repeat, you repeat, you repeat them, then they finish, finally disappears. Then you give a shock, you dishabituate it, and it goes on. This was called by Hernandez Peron, afferent neuronal habituation. And at the same time, when I could work mainly on uh, Saturday and Sunday, because the lab was usually taken by others uh, during the week, uh, okay, I 
again. <laughs> I'm just getting confused. Should go. Okay. I worked by myself on a project which was very Pavlovian to study the conditioning of uh, evoc potential, auditory evoc potential. So I give to a chronic cat, this was a chronic experiment, a, uh, tone. So I got evoc potential in the acoustic cortex. Then I associate the tone to a shock. And to my great surprise, I saw evoc potential not only on the acoustic cortex, but also at, on the motor cortex. Then after, if the shock was not habituated and the cat did not move, there was uh, only the evoc potential of the acoustic cortex. And this is me and my, uh, Professor Magoon and Professor French. This is a long beach time in uh, November 1954. Uh, so at this time, I was still uh, really uh, interested in Pavlovian conditioning, but uh, I had to go back. So after one year, I've learned a lot of uh, techniques. Then, okay, no, again. I know why it does not work, because the right here is not the right here. <laughs> oh, stupid. <laughs> oh. So, I made a wonderful trip span. This leaves us a time for new discovery. Thank you. For the paparazzi here, I, I remind you that there will also be a chance uh, at the reception, there, there will be a reception from six to eight, and I, I'm sure that Professor Kleitman, uh, Professor Azarinsky, Professor uh, Jouvet will be there for at least a while, and you can take a picture and get, get an autograph. This is you know, very valuable. Uh, we're about to close. I only wanted to um, tell one little thing just to fill in a little gap. I, uh, I went to New York from the University of Chicago, uh, and I left in 1957. I had gone directly from medical school into a uh, postgraduate program without uh, taking an internship, but I finally decided I would probably need to earn a living and that studying dreaming wasn't going to be it. Uh, little did I know, of course. But uh, in New York, we still had this problem. Was this, was this light sleep, or was it something totally different? And in 1959, I was aware of Jouvet's work, but there was this uh, disc jockey who was going to stay up for 200 hours in Times Square. His name was Peter Tripp. Some of you may remember that. Um, and I thought, well, if I could study his sleep after this incredible wakefulness marathon, if REM sleep was light sleep, his, his um, sleep would surely be so deep it would totally disappear. And that would sort of confirm, yes, this was light sleep. But if it didn't disappear, if something else happened, then it was clear that it was completely different from the remainder of sleep. And so there was one moment for me, I've had several of these moments when he finally, after 200 hours with reporters and everything, went to sleep. He, after a few minutes of non-REM sleep, went into a 50-minute REM period. And that was that. Was that. And uh, so we owe something to Peter Tripp also. <laughs> well, I think that, that this has been a just remarkable uh, uh, symposium. And I'm, I'm so profoundly grateful to Jerry that, that he did this, because I, yeah. <laughs> Because what, what you heard from these three giants is truly our heritage. And um, so now we, 
we ha really have our heritage for the for the very first time. And, and as uh, Michelle said, we, we still have a ways to go. Uh, he's an eternal optimist, of course. And that makes me think, I know they're doing something. One last little thing, the, the kind of the worst trauma for me was, I think was in maybe 1956 when uh, Professor Kleitman was beginning to think about retiring because retirement was mandatory at the age of 65 in those days. He said, uh, and I knew he was beginning to work on the revision of sleep and wakefulness. And oh, by the way, when this echoed uh, Gene's remark, that was a remarkable book. The first thing he said to me when I knocked on his door was, have you read my book? And I said, no. He said, well, read it. And I did, which was the, that was the, the crossroads, a remarkably clear, wonderful book. Anyway, I knew he was revising it, and I see these cards with thousands of cards of references and working and translating in different languages, read in six languages. He said, if anything happens to me, Bill, Will you, will you finish the book? <laughs> and from that day on, every day I said a little prayer. And it, and it worked! <laughs> so I'm hoping someone will give me a signal. Uh, we have a very special event now. Um, I'm sort of vamping, I guess. And because it is the 100th birthday, uh, of Professor Kleitman, there will be a birthday cake. I, I have a feeling it's about to emerge. We have a birthday cake, and we, you all join us. Not, we'll sing happy birthday, <laughs> and you'll all then can join Professor Kleitman in blowing out the candles. You can help him blow out the candles. So they're bringing the there's a look over that way. You see your cake over there? Huh? <laughs> One thing out. Huh? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy Thank you.